Hey, welcome back to Well, That's Interesting, the I Can't Believe What I'm Hearing edition. <laughs> Today, Today is episode 142, the exploding teeth epidemic of the 1800s, and what happens if you stow away on a trip to the moon. I know, the, you heard it, it was teeth exploding. Now, my friends, as you can tell by the title of this episode, God damn, this one is going to hurt. That's right. The human body is going to take one hell of a beating today. In the first half of the show, we'll be covering an actual, totally factual event you may not have heard of before. And after today, you'll probably wish you never heard of it at all. (laughs) But back in the good old U.S. of A., clearly a nation known for its stellar health care, during the good old 1800s, clearly a time known for its pragmatic approach to illness, a number of patients went to their old-timey dentists uh, with a complaint. Um, Their teeth had exploded in their mouths. I know, I know. Luckily, not all of their teeth, but, but enough to say, Jesus Christ, one, one is too many. So yeah, these folks had a tooth or two pop right inside their noggin, and we're gonna take a look into the running theory as to why why this happened during this time period. My God. Then after the break, the explosions and discomfort. No, they're not going to stop with teeth, my friends. With space, with space travel, fast becoming the latest egotistical driven obsession for billionaires and the 1%, there's a hot chance a not so rich person will try and stuff their body into a compartment of a phallically looking ship to hitch a ride. We know it's going to happen. So if they do, if, if when eventually it does happen, we have to ask, what is going to happen to their body? Well, my friends, this hypothetical situation means, but what else? We're busting out everyone's favorite new segment. Let's read from a book, motherfucker. And brace yourself. That book is not, and I repeat, is not What If Volume 2 by Randall Monroe. I know, I know. I could feel, I could feel your shock through, I could, I could, your phone, your car radio, your fucking, I don't know. I could feel it, I could feel it from here. So that means if you want more of the incredible goodness that was What If Volume 2, please go out and get yourself a copy. I just fucking loved that book. I still love it, I have it, and so should you. So what is this new book will be meandering through, and will it be just as delightfully dangerous and ridiculous? Well, you fucking bet it will be. We're cracking open, and then you're dead by Cody Cassidy and Paul Doherty. Now, if you're a long, long motherfucking time listener and long member of the flock, you know I've used this book before as a source for topics back in the day, but now I thought, you know what, let's just dive right the fuck in, and consume entire hypotheticals and, quote, the most outlandish deaths you can imagine. Let's dive right in. And that quote is from the book's abstract. So today, on page 41, we're going to tackle what would happen if you stowed away on a trip to the moon. And as you could imagine, it's bad. But how that bad unravels is incredibly interesting and something you definitely want to bring up at a party as small talk, uh, just to make things uncomfortable. I know I'm going to, and by the way, I'm Jill Chacha, and if this is your first time listening, welcome to the flock, my intergalactic business goose. You're gonna wanna buckle the fuck up and hold on to your dental floss, because we're about to begin. And to do so, we need to charge up our favorite time machine and dial it way the fuck back to the inconceivable early 1800s, specifically, 1817. 1817. I know. How does anyone have any teeth at this time? But they did, and they do, and here we are. At eight, in 1817, in Mercer County, Pennsylvania. And we're overlooking a truly bizarre scene. A scene that was described by a Pennsylvania dentist called W.H. Atkinson, which is so perfectly old-timey. And he published this account in the even- better old-timey named journal Dental Cosmos. I swear, I swear, that's what it's called, Dental Cosmos. This story was published in 1860, but again, it took place, the actual events took place in 1817. 
and it involved a reverend who was experiencing such a toothache, his behavior was as though he was possessed. Quote, During his agonies, he ran about here and there in the vain endeavor to obtain some respite, at one time boring his head on the ground like an enraged animal, at another poking it under the corner of the fence, and again going to the spring and plunging his head to the bottom in the cold water, which so alarmed his family that they led him to the cabin and did all in their power to compose him. But all proved unavailing, till at nine o'clock the next morning, as he was walking the floor in wild delirium, all at once a sharp crack, like a pistol shot, bursting his tooth into fragments, gave him instant relief. At this moment he turned to his wife and said, My pain is all gone. He went to bed and slept soundly all that day and most of the succeeding night, after which he was rational and well. End quote. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot, but you heard me. You heard me right, friends. The man's goddamn tooth shattered in his head. Now, he seemed to be okay with this, just going to bed, nor sh- showing any concern that another tooth might just fucking go off like a grenade. But it's the early 1800s, so I assume there was more to worry about. Anyway, unlike the Reverend, you probably have a lot of questions, like how, how, and fucking why, and has this happened to anyone else before? Well, my friends, those are great questions. So let's start with this. Yes, this has happened to other people. Mm -hmm. Just 13 years after the Reverend went pop, another patient, just a few miles away, a woman named Mrs. Letitia D. (laughs) Sorry. Letitia D. I mean, I'm just, no matter how many times I read it, I'm not prepared. I'm not prepared when I say it out loud. Now, Mrs. Letitia D., she was suffering an equally prolonged toothache, but, quote, it terminated by bursting, giving immediate relief, end quote, from Atkinson's report. Uh, Then there was a Mrs. Anna, who in 1855 experienced one of her canines erupting. (laughs) God. Now, these tooth bomb incidents culminate with one of the most flamboyantly written accounts I've ever read. I'm going to do my best to get through this, this old-timey language, but <clears throat> we're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to, it's going to be great. And this one was penned by dentist J. Phelps Hibbler. Uh, Hibbler. <laughs> Sorry, these names. Uh, this is about a patient in 1874. Okay, here we go. Quote, Just before the explosion took place, the tooth was aching dreadfully, disturbing the harmonical equanimity of every part of her organism, to the extent that, I can't believe I nailed that, to the extent that that she, at moments, was laboring under slight aberrations of mind. All at once, without any symptom other than the previous severe aching, the tooth, a right lower molar, bursted with such a concussion and rapport that well nigh knocked her over, splitting the tooth and very much shattering the organ otherwise. End quote. Oh my God, I'm exhausted. <laughs> oh, he could have edited that a little bit. Now, Hibbler, Hibbler went on to say, again, not only did this burst, not only did this tooth shattering, was so, it was so intense it knocked the woman over, it, quote, ended in rendering her quite deaf for a considerable length of time. The whole thing did not occupy but a moment, and the tooth ceased aching at once. End quote. Well, of course, it stopped hurting because it was in pieces, but holy shit, the lady went deaf for a little bit. That's how intense it was. So, in sum, my friends, this here tooth a poppin' thing was a thing in the 1800s. And this leads us to our other questions, like fucking how... And why? Why did it happen? Well, there's some good news and bad news about this. (laughs) I know, you're like, good news. (laughs) Well, I'm happy to say the cases of exploding teeth dried up at the end of the 1800s, but that means we don't have any newer cases 
or newer case studies to get solid answers. So we're going to have to come up with a hypothesis as to how and why, based on what we know old-timey dentists were using back in the day. And um, you might want to hold on to something, mostly your teeth, because this is going to feel uncomfortable. Okay, <clears throat> here we go. My friends, according to Thomas Morris of the BBC, a wide variety of metals were used to fill dental cavities, including lead, tin, silver, and various alloys. Now, if this sounds like a bad idea, it was. From the BBC article, The Gruesome and Mysterious Case of Exploding Teeth, quote, Andrea Sella, professor of inorganic chemistry at University College London, points out that if two different metals had been used, this would create an electrochemical cell. Effectively, the whole mouth would be turned into a low-voltage battery. She went on to comment, quote, because of the mixture of metals you have in the mouth, there might be spontaneous electrolysis. My favorite explanation is that if a filling were badly done so that part of the cavity remained, that would mean the possibility of a buildup of hydrogen within a tooth, end quote. That was a lot too, my friends, but you pretty much have the gist of it. In sum, maybe an electric current paired with a little hydrogen could have made the teeth go boom. <laughs> now we can't say for sure as the pieces of teeth are long gone and there's no record of what these people had in their mouths. Like what, if any, metals. So this is just a theory and the exploding teeth epidemic is still pretty much a mystery to this day, but you know what? I really dig the mouth bombs. I just dig at the accidental mouth bomb. I mean, yeah, I, I can see you're nodding with me. You agree. After the break, no more exploding teeth. But don't you worry, we do have exploding lungs. And boiling blood. I know. <laughs> so I'm not giving you a break. Uh, you're going to want to stick around for this because we're heading to the moon and uh, we don't have a ticket or a seat. But we're going to get there and it's not going to end well. Stay tuned. Hello, everyone. You may recognize me as Gabby from the History of Everything podcast. And my name is Bruna, and you don't recognize me from anything yet. Together, we're two scientists who explore all of the weird little questions and conspiracies of the universe in our new podcast, Mystery of Everything. Everything has an explanation. We hope. But that is what we're here to figure out. We will dive into the science behind many popular conspiracy theories, such as vaccines causing autism, flat earth theory, and was the moon landing fake? And if so, why the heck would anyone even do that? But it's not just conspiracies. There's a lot of cool mysteries that we will attempt to use science to explain, such as near-death experiences, what made the Vikings go berserk, and can I control my co-host with MK Ultra? Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, make sure to check out the Mischief Everything podcast everywhere where you find your podcasts. When Johann Rahl received the letter on Christmas Day, 1776, he put it away to read later. Maybe he thought it was a season's greeting and wanted to save it for the fireside. But what it actually was, was a warning, delivered to the Hessian colonel, letting him know that General George Washington was crossing the Delaware and would soon attack his forces. The next day, when Rawl lost the Battle of Trenton and died from two colonial Boxing Day musket balls, the letter was found, unopened in his vest pocket. As someone with 15,000 unread emails in his inbox, I feel like there's a lesson there. Oh well, this is The Constant, a history of getting things wrong. I'm Mark Chrysler. Every episode, we look at the bad ideas, mistakes, and accidents that misshaped our world. Find us at constantpodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey everyone, Jill Chacha here from Well That's Interesting, and I am absolutely thrilled to tell you about Spotify for Podcasters. I use it, I love it, and it all started by downloading the free Spotify for Podcasters app, which has all the tools you need in one place to record and edit your masterpiece of a podcast. Spotify for Podcasters also distributes your show to all major platforms, so when you hit publish, your episodes will stream not only on Spotify, but I'm talking about the Apples, the Googles, Stitcher, Good Pods, 
the other ones. <laughs> you get the idea. And you can monetize your podcast with no minimum listenership required. You could also set up monthly subscriptions and record ads just like this one. So what are you waiting for? Download Spotify for Podcasters today and start changing the world. Oh, and please, stay interesting. 20th Century Studios presents Vacation Friends 2. Now streaming only on Hulu. Look at us all together again. We just wanted to give you guys a real honeymoon. Shots! 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 Right. Now streaming. Dad! He was just released from jail. Where can I get a drink around here? Back on vacation. This place is nice. It's drug lord nice. I'm sorry, drug lord nice? With more baggage. Ever since he showed up, he turned this relaxing vacation into total chaos. Who does that? Vacation Friends 2. Rated R. Now streaming only on Hulu. And we're back. We are so back. And my friends, we just shoved our cute little asses into a compartment somewhere on a space shuttle destined for the moon. Now, we don't have a seat or a ticket, and the astronauts or billionaires or whoever the fuck is driving has no idea we're aboard. We're totally castaways. We also have no spacesuit or anything to shield us from the death trap, which is outer space. So we must ask ourselves, what exactly would happen to our fragile, unprepared bodies during flight? And what would happen if we stepped out of the ship and onto the surface of the moon after landing? If you thought, well, <laughs> it can't be good. <laughs> and you thought, you know what, this sounds like my favorite new segment. Let's read from a book, motherfucker. You're absolutely right on both accounts. <laughs> Today, it's And Then You're Dead by Cody Cassidy and Paul Doherty. Holy shit. We should just begin. Here we go. Like I mentioned, you and I are stuffed butt cheek to butt cheek, hidden away in some compartment. And we can hear, we can hear the liftoff countdown hit zero. And my friends, for the next eight minutes, our ship will accelerate to 25,000 miles per hour. And our butt cheeks and everything else will endear four Gs. Now, this may be a shock to many of you, but I never received any training to combat the effects of something like 4G on the body. Training like astronauts receive and pilots receive, and I'm pretty goddamn sure there's a chance you never received that treatment or that training either. <laughs> We're also not wearing the proper suits or sitting in the padded seats the other riders have, which means we'd probably pass out for a few minutes. And my friends, this is just the beginning. Quote, you would also need to hope the space agency added some extra fuel for the trip because with your extra 200 pounds of body weight, the spacecraft's trajectory would be incorrect and the engineers would have to fire maneuvering rockets to adjust course. End quote. Well, that's embarrassing. And I think at this point, the jig is up and they discovered we're aboard. But... We're already too far from Earth, and we can't turn this car around. So we're stuck on this ship, my friends. We are stuck on this ship bound for the moon, which will take three days in zero gravity. And just like with the G-forces, I bet you never trained for that either. Quote, Exactly how sick you would become depends on the quality of the connection between your brain and inner ear. Nobody's connection is flawless. If you spun underwater, your inner ear can't tell which way is up. But the higher your fidelity, the stronger the disagreement between your brain and inner ear, the sicker you will get. End quote. Oof, my friends, I hate to break this to you, but puking in zero gravity, it's a dangerous game. Especially with no training to handle the nausea. Because, once again, um, you'll pass out and... But this time, you might drown in your own vomit. Yeah. But let's just say, hypothetically, we were fucking champions, and somehow nobody choked to death on their puke. So high five. Good job. High fives all around. We're totally celebrating. But I know what you're thinking. Won't this celebration be kind of short? I mean, we're eventually going to land and take a nice little spacewalk, right? And yeah, you're absolutely right. We just landed. And shit... Shit's really going to hit the fan. Quote, The moon, just like space, is an airless vacuum, which is why your fellow astronauts will be wearing their expensive and cumbersome spacesuits when they step onto it. 
When you venture out onto the moon in your more comfortable outfit, you will die, but not instantly. And how do we know this? In 1966, a NASA technician proved it. While testing a spacesuit in a vacuum chamber, a faulty hose caused the suit to de depressurize. He was in the vacuum unprotected for 87 seconds before the chamber could be repressurized. For most of that time, all but the first 10 seconds, he was unconscious. But fortunately, other than an earache from the rapid pressure changes, he was unharmed. The lesson is in a vacuum, the human body can survive for a minute, maybe even two, without protection, but can only stay conscious for about 10 seconds. End quote. Hmm. 10 seconds. Well, it sounds like our little spacewalk is going to be a short one, doesn't it? And my friends, unfortunately, though, no one is going to repressurize the moon for us, which means, you guessed it, we're not going to wake up. And depending on where we are on the moon, well, that's going to have a huge impact on what we feel for those brief 10 seconds and what's going to happen to our beautiful corpses. Quote, are you on the sunny side or the shady side? Because that makes a difference. Earth takes about 24 hours to do a full rotation, but the moon takes an entire month, which means one side is allowed to bake in the sun for 15 days and heats up to 253 degrees Fahrenheit, while the shady side gets down to 243 degrees below zero. End quote. Hmm, so... I think I know what you're thinking. Would we instantly melt or become a popsicle? Great questions. Here is the super cool answer. No, to either. We're in a vacuum, pretty much. So things, things are going to get funky. Quote, if the sun was down and it was 243 below, you would feel a chill, but not freeze. Because 243 below zero in a vacuum is different from walking into 243 degrees below zero on Earth. Without any atmosphere, heat transfer happens slowly. If you landed on the shady side, the temperature change would feel roughly like stepping into a cool room naked. Then, because the boiling temperature of water is lower than your body temperature in a vacuum, you would feel a chill as your sweat instantly boiled off. If you landed on the sunny side, where it's 253 degrees above zero, the vacuum would again save you from baking. But because the radiating heat from the hot surface of the moon, oh, because of the radiating heat from the hot surface of the moon, you'd feel just a bit warmer than on a sunny day in Death Valley. End quote. All right. Okay. That doesn't sound so bad, right? Sunny side, shady side. Well, that's, here's the thing, though. That's just the temperature side of things. Y'all, we're not in Kansas anymore, so please brace yourself. Quote, you would also need to take into consideration the sun. More specifically, it's UV radiation. The sun is firing x-rays, ultraviolet light, and high-energy particles of radiation at us at all times. Fortunately, for everyone on Earth's surface, the planet's atmosphere ozone and magnetic field take care of most of that, and sunscreen or clothing blocks the rest. Under these, layers of uh, under these layers of protection, life can thrive. But for anyone above the atmosphere, the situation is radically different. If you applied SPF 50 before stepping out, in a few seconds, you would get enough radiation to give you a healthy tan. Within 15 seconds, you would absorb a dose that would eventually develop into a blistering third-degree sunburn. End quote. Now, that blows, for sure. Uh, but remember, at 10 seconds, we would most likely pass out, so we wouldn't see, we wouldn't see the horror. But I know why you're here. You probably want to see the fucking horror. <laughs> so you're thinking, okay, I can get past 15 seconds. I'll just hold my breath. Maybe that'll give me a few more moments of survival. Well, let me tell you something. The last fucking thing you want to do in a vacuum is hold your breath. Now, hold on to your burned butt cheeks and listen to this. Quote, if you took a deep breath and held it before you left the lunar module, the air in your lungs would instantly expand, 
ripping apart the delicate avioli sacs. The best way to deal with this is prevention. Instead of filling your lungs or holding your breath as you exit the craft, you would need to keep your mouth open, letting the gas in your lungs rush out. Your blood contains enough oxygen to give you about 10 to 15 seconds of consciousness. After, you would pass out, and the 1960s research into vacuum, vacuum exposure with dogs yeah, shows that after two minutes, you would be brain dead. Once your heart stopped beating, that's when things would get gruesome. End quote. Okay, hold up. I know, I know exactly what you're underlining here. What, what the fuck, 1960s using dogs? I'm just as pissed as you when I read that, when I said it. And because of that anger, you probably missed that last line. Like, what will happen to our corpses is going to be way worse than exploding lungs. And we're going to get into it right the fuck now. Quote, We said earlier that the boiling point of water is below body temperature in a vacuum, so all your sweat would boil off, along with your tears and saliva. But that's the water on the outside of your body. The water inside of you, namely water in your blood, would take tens of seconds to start to boil. You would be unconscious and soon dead, so this is more of a cosmetic issue than anything else, but your blood Boil your, but as your blood boiled and turned into a gas, your skin would expand until stretched taut, fully inflating you into a human balloon. Eventually, that gas would escape your body and you would deflate, but the process of ripping your skin from its anchors would probably result in at least a few new wrinkles. Now, there aren't any bugs or bacteria living on the moon, just the ones living inside you, but they would be killed by the vacuum, and while temperature swings as well, so you would not rot or decompose. Assuming your fellow astronauts didn't want to haul you back, it's understandable the way you look, you would stay on the moon for many thousands of years as a well-preserved, desiccated, wrinkly old moon person. (laughs) End quote. Holy fuck, am I right? I bet you didn't see your deflated, well-preserved body coming, did you? (laughs) That's fucking wild. So thank you for listening, rating, subscribing, telling your friends about the goddamn teeth, the the mini bombs in their mouths on accident. And uh, tell them what happens if they stowed away on the moon, uh, on a trip to the moon. Uh, You'd pass out, expand, and uh, basically preserve yourself forever. It's fucking wild. Ah, man. You know what? Stay interesting.